Here we go. Hi, welcome to Control Talk Now, your smart buildings video cast and podcast for the week ending May 9th, 2021. This is episode 399, where we talk about HVAC controls, smart building controls, and whatever else, your co-host and mine, the man, the myth, the legend, the one, the only, and I've said it 399 times, Kenny Smyers wants to talk about, welcome to the show, Big Dog. Well, thank you very much, Eric. Yeah, 399. Well, 400's looming uh, around the bender. But uh, I guess the first thing I need to say is happy Mother's Day to all our fabulous mothers and, and wives and, and daughters. Um, happy Mother's Day. So. Happy Mother's Day for sure. I tell you what, God, that's right. I guess I better get upstairs and cook some <laughs> breakfast or something. So I'm in big trouble. But no, no, no happy Mother's Day for sure. And Dude, our audience wants to know you were on another secret mission last week. Uh, where was it? Was it Afghanistan? Was it Moscow? Was it the Middle no, East? No, it was, it, was a, it was really tame, tame visit out west to, to visit with my daughter. And then we had a uh, jumped on a plane and went out to Hawaii. So it was a, a beautiful uh, escape. And uh, we really enjoyed it. It was an anniversary, 38th anniversary celebration and my daughter's 34th birthday. So we combined. Yeah. yeah. Now, Mark P. talked to me, you use code like Hawaii means like hotspot and anniversary <laughs> means like I uh, can't talk about it and stuff. Lena like that. Marcus, Mark was lived in New York at, at the fast pace. And so God only knows what the, the, their codes meant. But yeah, uh, mine's just straight stick stuff for <clears throat> no, no, uh, no, nothing more than. But uh, everything I ever heard about it was a bucket list thing. Uh, and the movies, uh, you know, with uh, Elvis Presley and all that stuff is. And of course, the. Uh, the Memorial Pearl Harbor Memorial that was a, a really immensely uh, interesting and emotional site you know to, yeah. but um, the uh, it's beautiful beyond belief uh, we went to the Dole Plantation you know saw the largest um, uh, what do you call it maize in the world and then huh. uh, went to a coffee plantation a little one saw co coffee got made I mean, just all kinds of education stuff like that so just an enormously interesting and then next you know seven days zip by and back home we are a lot of traveling. That's a like four thousand eight hundred miles or something. So, dude, I'm very happy for you. And again, happy anniversary and happy happy birthday to your daughter. And uh, wow, you. dude, well, we missed you, but uh, you know we had a good crew. Ken Sinclair did a nice job filling in last I week. I saw that. Thought. I saw that. Yeah. And uh, so it's good stuff there. And dude, we uh, we got a great guest this week. And let's just get on with it because I can't wait to hear what this guy has to say. How about introducing him? Eric, I'd love to. Leon Werfel, he's the CEO of Wayno, and he's, he's, we're talking to him out of Melbourne, Australia. Uh, Leon's been to, on the show a couple of times before. Uh, he's, he's the third time he's on Control Talk now, and uh, welcome to the show, Leon. Welcome, Leon. Thank you, guys. It's, uh, it's great to see you again. Thanks for having me. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's really nice to connect again. Oh, it's so cool. And, you know, Leon, for our audience who might not remember you, you know, give us a brief history. So, you know, I know you got away from acting and decided you want to do something more useful with your life. So tell us how you started Bueno. And maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, your acting career later on in the show. We have time, but go ahead. Tell us about Bueno. <laughs> uh, you're making me blush. All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs> okay. So I'll give you, so I'll give you a high level overview of Bueno. So we're, we're a software company enabling the property industry to transition to a centralized, data-driven, sustainable operational model. Uh, and what our purpose is, is to realize the dream of a sustainable future through data. And what does that actually mean? It means leveraging all of the operational technology and, and uh, operational technology data and enterprise, um, enterprise, uh, enterprise software data uh, in the property space in order to create value for um, create value for our customers in optimizing their operations. Uh, we've been around since 2013. Uh, we started uh, yeah, in July, 2013. Um, my, my background prior to this, you know, what, what we kind of saw in the, in the marketplace was that there's the whole way the property industry runs is through people 
uh, looking at their calendars, saying today's a Monday, I've got to do this task because it's my weekly task, it's my monthly task, etc. cetera. Um, uh, what we, what we kind of saw as, as an opportunity in the industry was to take a lot of those tasks were being, that were being done on a, on a routine scheduled calendarized basis and instead do those diagnostics with algorithms instead. And now my background in starting point, the reason why I had such a strong feeling towards you know, trying to evolve the way that people were doing things um, was that I was one of those, I was one of those, one of those people. Um, I was a consultant, an energy efficiency consultant working with property portfolios to improve their energy efficiency performance of their assets. And I was one of those people where every three months I would sit in front of the BMS. I would look at what was going on. I would, this is how badly our industry uses data. I'd sometimes have to take photographs of the BMS screens so that I could take them with me offsite and data, do data entry to get them into a spreadsheet, uh, run some formulas. And then and that would tell me uh, what that building needed to focus on for, for its energy performance. Um, and doing that uh, quarter after quarter and month after month and year after year just really reinforced that there had to be a better way to get that information to the people that needed it. Very cool. Very, very cool. Well, thank goodness you did. And uh, like I said, we've had the pleasure of, of meeting you and seeing demos of your products at a couple of the events because you are very active in the United States as well as globally. And uh, so it's been, God, since COVID, we haven't seen you. So you've pretty much, I, I guess, have you been in, in Australia the whole time since COVID hit? Yeah, it was really awkward uh, timing, actually, because myself and a couple of, uh, yeah, my, myself and a couple of other team members from Bueno were actually planning to relocate to New York City in April of last year, which turned out to be, you know, not the most opportune kind of timing for us to pack up and move. So yeah, we've been, uh, we've been in Australia, in and out of lockdown, uh, down under. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, we've still been active. Uh, you know, we've got our software in eight countries around the world. Um, you know, we've got existing customers internationally. Um, it's just been like everyone, a lot more Zoom calls uh, and a lot less time on planes. <laughs> No, no, absolutely. Well, I know our audience is probably curious and I'm curious, uh, what's it like, uh, you know, down under with COVID? I mean, are you guys getting a bunch of vaccines out now? Or are you, got, I mean, what, 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 what are the requirements? Uh, is it business as usual back at the bars and, and the beaches or what's going on? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a bit different, I think, to the experience that uh, you guys are having in the US. Um, so our, our government took a bit more of an elimination strategy and that meant really, really hard lockdowns. So, um, you know, at various different points, we've had the government putting measures in place like curfews where you're not allowed out of your house after 8 p.m., like radiuses where you're not allowed to go more than a, a, a three-mile radius from your house. Uh, we had the, the military patrolling the state line. So not only could we not travel internationally, we couldn't even get from state to state uh, at, at different kind of points in time over the past year. So, um, yeah, I think that's been quite different. What it means now is that we've kind of gone through that pain and we've, uh, we feel like we've earned the, like given how crappy that was, we feel like we've earned uh, the freedoms back again. But yeah, life's pretty much back to normal. You know, if, if there's ever a single case in the country that's all over the front pages of the news, uh, all the different newspapers, you know, have states shutting their borders again, you know, uh, but there's, there's lots of snap lockdown, but pretty much life's back to normal, back at the beach, back at, uh, uh, back at the bars. Unfortunately, um, life's back to normal just in time for winter over here. So not oh, so much that's time. Right. That's right. <laughs> well, no, I got you, brother. So, so no shrimp on the barbie when it gets cold. But, uh, but so what, 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 what is the most outrageous conspiracy theory you've, you've heard down there? I mean, we've got them up here. Is, does it have to do with like, uh, you know, Russell Crowe and Mel Gibson uh, selling masks or Rupert Mur Mur Murdoch? Uh, when you play, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, so, 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 so when, when, when you do get a chance to talk to some of your buddies, what, what's the most outrageous conspiracy theory you've heard? Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure they're all the same ones that you guys hear, you know, microchips and vaccines, all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so I, I don't, I'm, I'm sure you guys are uh, just as well across that as, as I am. Well, <laughs> Kenny's, Kenny's got a few. But what's, the, what's the craziest Wait. ones that you guys have heard? Oh yeah. Uh, well, right now, believe it or not, we, uh, we live in Pennsylvania. I live in Pennsylvania. So uh, we are now uh, almost completely unfettered from the COVID restrictions and remain shelter in place and all that stuff. But you have to wear masks until 70% of the population has their shots. Okay. So right now we're like 
But guess what? There's an abundance of shots and, and, and everybody, all the distribution points, the shopping centers, all the medical urgent cares and whatever, all have it, but they won't go, people won't go get their shots. They won't go get the shots now. And it's because of, of things they've heard, um, you know, and, and, you know, and they just don't trust, apparently they don't trust, you know, big government uh, schemes like this. And so we might never, we didn't, might never get to 70% of Pennsylvania. We'll have to wear, wear masks forever, I guess. Well, you know? listen, Scott Cochran, wherever you are, please go get your vaccine shot because you're going to stop American football. If you don't become one of those 70%. <laughs> and uh, yeah, no, it's, it's crazy. But the crazy thing about it is, and, and, you know, and, and, and I was a little worried, you know, at first, but I mean, you know, I don't know, Leon, but like if we were to travel to Africa or Asia or whatever, we would get all kinds of vaccines for all kinds of things that our bodies, you know, aren't geared up for. Right. So, wouldn't think twice about that. I guess maybe the reward is, is, is more than that. But, uh, you know, I've, I've got a couple of people that I know that one of them is my uh, wife's brother. He's been on the, the research team with this thing. And, and uh, everybody's just telling me it's, it's bulletproof. I mean, it's, it's probably the safest vaccine that they've ever created. And the microchip, they just want to do that to make you safe. So when you're in a building, Leon Sissick can tap into you and track you. It'll make life more, more easy, right? Uh. Yeah, I mean, they, they already collect so much data. People, but there's already so much data being collected on your Yeah, phone. exactly, exactly. Yeah, Apple yeah, if you're Watch. worried about it, get rid of your phone and your computer much... and your car and, yeah, your credit cards because, yeah. Yeah, you don't need a phone anymore. They can track me your credit card. Leon, listen, let's get back back to the, uh, to the meat and potatoes here. Uh, you guys won the prestigious award, the ARBS Industry Award 2020, and it was for Software Digital Excellence uh, and project excellence. Tell us about that and and how you achieved that and what was the driving factors. Yeah, that was um, that was a really big uh, honor for us. So um, that's the Australian Refrigeration and Building Services um, uh, uh, event that they have, and that's uh, I guess the biggest um, um, building services uh, conference um, that they have in Australia. It's on every couple of years, and we got uh, awarded the best digital product there, which was pretty great. Um, it's really uh, exciting and it's great to get that kind of recognition. Uh, we also got um, uh, we also got recognized for uh, the Project Excellence Award, which was um, that was for our work with a company called Woolworths, who's a, a really great customer of ours. Uh, and and your, your listeners may not have heard of um, Woolworths, but they're the biggest they're the biggest grocery uh, chain in Australia. They, they represent about 40% of the grocery stores in Australia. Wow. They represent about one, uh, a bit over 1% of the energy consumption of the whole country. Um, oh. And uh, the work that we've done there has been really about taking their existing operational model, which is following that kind of preventative approach we we're talking about before with calendars, um, you know, weekly, monthly checklists and checks and that kind of thing, and evolving that to... Uh, uh, be more more centralized, be more data driven, uh, and have helped them set up a centralized, specialized team in their head office to help manage the energy performance and manage all their refrigeration systems. So think about like kind of like an operation center enabled by uh, data analytics. Very cool. How many how many locations do they have roughly, Leon? Oh, they've got a lot. They've got a lot. They've got uh, about a thousand grocery okay. stores across Australia. They've also got a couple of hundred grocery stores in New Zealand. Um, they've got a couple hundred uh, uh, liquor stores across Australia as well. Um, and so we're, we're rolled out across all across that complete fleet of um, properties for them. Well, so, so when you say uh, the word centralization, let's talk about that, because that seems like a, a core driver for a lot of your clients, right? Speak about that and why, why, why your customers care about that. Why is that so important? Oh, it's it's um that's a great question, and uh, I think that you know if you if you kind of break it down to its building blocks, um, the, what we've been doing the, the basic building blocks of what we've collectively been doing as an industry, you know, we've been opening things up, we've been breaking down silos, and we've been centralizing more and more of the building blocks of technology uh, in the industry. Everyone's working, been working to unlock proprietary protocols, you know, apply open. Um, data ontologies, et cetera. And uh, you know, what we've been doing from a technology side of things is really trying to centralize um, uh, the technology capabilities of the industry. Now, it doesn't really make sense to have all these new tools, all these new centralized capabilities, and then still try and do the same old ways of working. 
Um, so, you know, what with off the back of these new capabilities, and, the, and you know, the cost of this of, a, of rolling this stuff is uh, of, of deploying this stuff is coming down, um, which then makes the business case attractive for doing this kind of like operational or this digital transformation exercise more attractive. Um, uh, the 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 ways of working um, need to evolve to in order to fully take advantage of you know, these centralized tech tools. Um, so what does that mean? That means uh, instead of having that one-to-one -one relationship between a building and a, and a team or a building and a facility manager, it means breaking down the building into individual specialized systems and having those systems managed by centralized specialized teams leveraging scale, leveraging the technology uh, and all the tools that are available to them. Um, now, why is this also important is, is also the human side. Um, technology allows us to be more productive. If we look at the, the um, labor market or the, the talent uh, pool, all, around, all the way around the world, you've got a, a, a seriously aging population in the facilities and operations space. Um, you've already got uh, a shortage of people to fill um, fill roles, and this is only going to get worse as more time goes past and as more people retire and leave the market and take that that um, tribal knowledge and that understanding of of uh, our property operations with them. Um, so you're going to have this gap opening up over time, and it's it's not something that we have to worry about tomorrow. It's something that we have to worry about today. Uh, I was talking to a, um, a contractor, a, a services contractor the other day who had 200 job openings for technicians right now. They are, they are. Wow, wow, wow. Spending, wow. They're spending more than a million bucks a year just on recruiter space. Jeez, wow. that's unbelievable. Kenny, are you seeing similar things like that in the States, you think? Yes, yes. In fact, uh, you hit the nail on the head when you said that exactly the. Uh, the two pools, you know, one side is getting older and the other one uh, is younger, but not coming into our, our, our industry. Uh, we had a study from uh, Renee Joseph. Uh, she said by the year 2024, 60% of the industry is going to retire. That's the facility managers, the control specialists, product specialists, contractors, distributors. It's just, it, it, like you said, it's, it's going to be a very, very, uh, you know, um, challenging uh, situation that has to be solved by technology and central management yeah. and, and you know Leon, i didn't want to interrupt you but I, i've been holding back uh, you guys got uh, this this is thing that i don't think uh the u.s market knows and that is that australia was actually kind of ahead of the whole game because you guys put it into uh you put it into regulations there was no if uh, you know you want to do it do it or you know it wasn't you know state by state it was that this is going to get done so you guys have a maturity here in this this part of the business that i, I think is why you're so successful and uh Tell us a little bit how the regulation uh, work, because maybe some of the people in our, our market will hear it and want to try to do that too. Yeah, sure. Um, I think that Australia is a pretty unique place when it comes to our property market for um, you know one reason in particular, and that there has been this uh, regulatory focus on operational performance in our industry for a long time. Now, um, that means that we have kind of different flavors of rating systems, et cetera, compared to what, uh, what you, you, you folks are used to in the US. Um, I kind of separate these rating systems like LEED, um, over here, our equivalent of that screen, Green Star. Um, there's also BRIAM in the, in, the, in the UK, but there's two, two kind of flavors of rating systems. There are um, feature-based ones, which is, you know, you have these kind of features, solar panels, you know, recycled materials, tick, tick, tick. And then they'll give you points and they'll give you a, a certain rating. But then on the, other, on the other side, there are these operational or there's performance-based rating systems, which is every 12 months, take in your IEQ data, get a rating. Every 12 months, take in your utilities data, get a rating. You have to maintain it. You could have the, you could have the um, prettiest building on the street and have a really poor rating if you can't run it right. Or you could have the ugliest duckling building on the on the street and if you are able to operate it well you can still get a five or a six star rating so i think that's a really um uh that's, that's that's kind of allowed our industry to evolve and be very sophisticated when it comes to looking at operational performance and the reason why we had this uptake of the you know, performance-based ratings schemes is like here's just a little bit of a history lesson is back in 2007 
So this is already like almost 15 years ago. 2007, the government started mandating that they would only take tenancies in uh, buildings with more than a four and a half star rating. Um, so then suddenly, you know, you, you got all these kind of perverse incentives in the property industry with, you know, the landlords trying to pass on as many of the costs as possible to the tenants. So what's their, what's, that's that split incentive problem. Like what, what is their incentive to actually save energy? Well, the government doing that started tying back the operational performance of the buildings to the core business of the landlords, which meant that they wouldn't be able to lease that building to a government tenant unless they maintained a certain level of performance. And that then started the ball rolling where other corporates would then say, hey, I want four and a half stars. Then the next guy would say, oh, their competitor would say, I want five stars. I'm going to put that in my annual report. And it really kind of became this, um, you know, for, for, the, for the force of good, like this kind of competitive uh, uh, thing where different companies were trying to position themselves better against each other. It, it then ended up in, I think it was 2011, 2012, becoming a government requirement that if you wanted to lease space, you have to have one of these ratings in place. And also as part of the advertisement for that space, you had to put what the rating, what the energy rating was of that particular building that you're leasing that space in. So that means you've got all these people putting up big billboards on the side of their building saying, you know, 100,000 square feet for, for lease. Um, it looks pretty bad if they have a zero star rating on there. Wow, well, that, that is an incentive. See, we're starting to get there. I mean, New York City uh, is finally uh, putting some teeth into their their programs. It's not a, a decision that the owner can make anymore because if they don't do it, they'll be penalized. They'll be fined every month if they don't take measures to uh, optimize their energy. And and you know, these have to be you know uh, very demonstrable measures. You know, these aren't things like saying it's in progress or whatever. You know, a nice you know paragraph written. It has to be physically uh, verifiable, and that's just taken now. I mean, it's just and and, and there's already a whole lot of uh, pushback and grief. You know, it's just we just have a different system. Then we got to go through that with each state can do their own determine their own fate and fortune. So just you know, but we'll get there. But uh, I think that's why people need to take a look at Bueno because you have so much more experience. I mean, uh, there's some there's some good stuff that we have, uh, and uh, there's a lot of good energy people here in the states too. But I was very impressed with your your site and 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 looking into it again because I think we talked to you back in 2017 and you were doing really well in 2018 again. Uh, we saw you down there at the Realcom. Uh, I kind of believe it was in uh, Nashville. Uh, and uh, I was very impressed. And, and also, Bueno, I, if I remember correctly, Bueno stands for Building Energy Optimization. Is that correct? Sorry, Built Environment Optimization. Ah, doggone it. Built Environment. <laughs> Damn, I thought it was just going to be like, good bueno, you know? I mean, yeah. <laughs> But I, I think it's important that people know that that isn't just a happenstance name. It actually uh, was an acronym for uh, a very important uh, idea. Well, yeah, and that's, that's what we're here for, right? Optimize the built environment. But I think that's a, it's, it's, um, uh, you know, it's a really good point what you raised about um, the adoption of those kind of, you know, the emerging adoption of those kind of performance rating schemes in the or performance rating or performance regulations in, in uh, the US. You know, it is it's different to Australia and Australia, they roll it out federally over the whole country. In the US, it seems to be uh, you know, more of a state by state um, right. based approach. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we, I, if, if anyone wants to talk about this stuff, I guess we've been doing it in Australia for like for 15 years already. So um, uh yeah, we've 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 got uh, a level of expertise in um, uh, in helping people to get the most out of what they've already got, rather than just trying to add new green features onto their building. Right, and to your point, you say uh, you say you turn pain points into, into profits, and those profits can fund, can pay for your next uh, solution of your your next pain point. You know, so you triage them, get the worst bleeder first, and then that money gets used to fix the next worst pain you have. And yeah, I, I yeah, totally. a lot of people just, uh, I mean, we say it all the time, we've got some great marketing, but it just doesn't have any, you know, there's just been a, a terrible lack of, of adoption, you know, it's, it's amazing. And that's a, that's a good segue, I think, pain points, right? Like, um, uh, you, 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 the, the best thing that can, technology can do for you is take away pain points. Um, uh, the best thing that uh, technology can do for you, like, and I think, you know, you, you mentioned that, uh, the industry struggle a bit with adoption. The best thing that can, technology can do for you isn't add additional pain points. It isn't like add things onto your to-do list. Um, it's to simplify your life and let you focus on what's important. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's right. Tough. That's what I was going to say. Tell me something that you haven't done today. Tell me, tell me something that you didn't do today. 
Oh my gosh, I, that might help me stay with my fourth wife if I can just get this to don't <laughs> list down. This is this sounds great. Sounds great. Well, For no, example, th- right? you didn't you didn't you didn't wake up and then roll out of bed and go feed your horse, did you? So you got a car because that having a car has helped you simplify your life. Uh, and take out a bunch of things that were probably pretty annoying and probably pain points for you um, and, and uh, allow you the, the luxury of extra time to focus on what's important. You, sure. you, didn't, you, I, didn't, I, I, you didn't have to... Uh, you didn't have to open the newspaper up to check what the weather forecast was going to be anymore. Um, technology, the, the, the technology that has um, really a, a, achieved very widespread adoption in society is stuff that it's giving you a focus on giving you a to don't list rather than giving you a to do list. Well, makes sense. I think you held up the phone too. You said like this that this was the biggest pain point remover was your phone because all those things you just said read the news, get the weather, and contact your people and get get yeah. get your business started. Uh, yeah, right and, there in your hand. Yeah, and be trackable so you don't have to get the vaccine, right? So that the government <laughs> can still track you for sure. But uh, you know, Leon, I, I wanted to sort of get back because you know Kenny mentioned marketing and and you know and uh, you, your company and, and just seeing your presentation, you, you guys really impressed me as being very marketing savvy. And it seems like you know Kenny that that our our buildings here, even if it's not required by law. You know, our younger generation seems to be much more concerned with buildings being more energy sustainable. We've seen some examples like Kenny with the Distech building we saw and how happy the tenants were that their building was saving energy. It seems like, at least in the U.S., we need to be thinking about ways to get people to come back to the building. And one of those could be, you know, making sure that the building's sustainable and, and highlighting, you know, how much energy it's saving. The other is, I think, Leon, we're faced with here is, is I think, how do you show people uh, and make people feel comfortable that their building is actually safe, right? And we've you know, on other episodes, we've talked about different technologies, everything from um, UV lights to ionization to air changes, things that would indicate that the building is, is safe. How would your software play with that? In other words, if an owner came to you and said, hey, we, we, we want to uh, sh- show our tenants on a consistent basis that the building's safe and, and get that front and center, how, how, how would you solve that problem or work with that? Uh, so in, in terms of showing that uh, the building is safe, I think the most valuable thing you can do is surface um, whatever activities you're taking, whatever measures you're putting in place, uh, make a commitment to your tenants, and then surface uh, the data that allows them to show that you're actually maintaining, you know, you're actually delivering on what those commitments are. So whether that happens to be, you know, introducing more fresh air, whether that happens to be, um, you know, improving the maintenance activities that you're like the, the schedules of maintenance activities you're doing. I think the most important thing is to surface that data and present it in a way that builds trust, um, uh, tells the uh, tells the tenants that you're doing something differently, and shows the commitment that you're actually executing on that. So, how would you do that? Um, you know, there's plenty of data being collected by um, platforms like ours that would help you communicate that message and continually reinforce it to the occupants of buildings. Um, and it's interesting, it's, it's really interesting because, um, again, it's in, 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 a, in, a, in Australia, we've had a kind of um, different experience throughout this process. And, um, you know, we're now at a point where life's, aside from the fact we can't travel overseas, life's kind of back to normal. People are getting back into the office. At least there's that momentum there to bring people back in. Um, but in order to get to this point, uh, there's been a lot of lockdowns. There's been a lot of very hard, very are very strict um, lockdowns to, to get here. And so one thing that we've had to develop in Australia is the ability to you know, respond to those lockdowns, the ability to hibernate buildings, the ability to make sure that they're maintaining a minimum amount of uh, operation throughout that, that period, you know, shut them down as far as possible to save energy and operating costs, but also run them a minimum amount so you don't build up risks, risk, uh, you know, you don't build up uh, unplanned maintenance um, uh, service work that's going to occur when you switch back on. So we, we actually did a lot of work uh, in Australia throughout this period in developing kind of like this kind of virtualized caretaker um, uh, tool where we could see that the that things were, were turned down as far as possible, but also see that, you know, you were, you were circulating enough air through your duct work that, and, and all the dampers were opening when you're doing that. So you didn't come back and have like... Uh, musty smells and mold growing in the ductwork. You know, the, all the 
water loops were circulating and all the valves were opening up when that was happening. So you didn't have any risks of um, uh, corrosion or anything like that or, or any water treatment issues. Um, so yeah, I guess it, it required us over here to develop that kind of, uh, to get really good at shutting our buildings down, switching them back on again. Um, but I, yeah, I guess going back to your previous point, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's about making a commitment and then, then it's about um, surfacing the information to build the trust that you're actually delivering what you're committed to do. I, I just, I, I wanted to plug real quick there, uh, Leon, I'm on your website and uh, I'm looking at your customer uh, profile and brochure. Uh, it's amazing. You, I mean, you got some big folks here, Intel, uh, Bellrock, CB, Richard Ellis, uh, Invest. Uh, I see McDonald's here, but is that Penn State, the Nittany Lions icon there? Because uh, that looks yeah. very... Is you work, you're working? You working at Penn State? I'll be done. We're doing some. We're doing some work with them. Yeah, we started. Uh, we started working with them. Uh, oh, the start of last year. No kidding. I, that's it. Uh, yeah, it's uh, been. It's been. Uh, yeah, even though it, you know we haven't been. Um, you know, even though we haven't been traveling, and even though it's been lots of Zoom calls rather than lots of um, <laughs> long haul international flights, which I don't know might be a better better kind of deal. Um, uh, you know, we, we've. Uh, you know, we haven't been sitting on our hands the last twelve months. Like we've added to our platform a couple hundred grocery stores in New Zealand. We've added, you know, five, I think about five million square feet of buildings in, in New York City of, of all places during the height of the, uh, you know, what's been going on. We just uh, added also the, um, there's apparently the, the, the new casino in Sydney, which apparently has the most luxurious hotel in the world in it. Nice. Uh, and yeah, I mean, there's, there's been a lot going on. Well, I, again, I had a correlated question to that. So I'm looking at this, um, very powerful uh, customer list. And I'm wondering, was it possible that you got some of them from your time at Realcom Ibicom? Oh, yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, the efficacy, that, we, we're trying to fight back and say, you know, the, the trade shows and the events that we've had, you know, can't live with them, can't live without them. This COVID thing put a lot of water on, on a lot of, uh, you know, dampened a lot of spirits. A lot of people now don't think they need to go anymore. And we're trying to revive the realization that there's something more than the remote meeting uh, or the Zoom meeting or whatever, that going to these events now is still very, very important. There's, there's nothing that's been more valuable to us in terms of building our profile outside of Australia in that than going to these events um, and uh, having conversations with people, trying to understand what their needs are and what their problems are Super. and you know, figuring out whether it's like a mutual solution that we can kind of come to. And you know, that you can't replace, um, there's just no way to replace the kind of opportunities for these like serendipitous conversations to happen. Um, these like shared kind of moments of insight to occur than uh, having these kind of in-person conferences. You can't, you just can't replicate the same chemistry, the same opportunity for, um, uh, opportunity for like uh, just ch like luck and chance and, and meeting. Well, yeah, meeting well said, yeah. serendipity was the word, uh, you know, it's a, uh... So much of that is, you know, it just happens. Uh, synchronistic, uh, you know, somebody looking for something at the same time it's on your mind. They bump into each other. It's a magnetic. Uh, internally, a, a lot of stuff happens that we can't, we cannot reproduce that digitally. It has to happen human, human to human. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. And you can't have cocktail hour um, virtually. It's kind of hard <laughs> to do. Otherwise, we'd be doing it. We'd be doing it right now, even though it's morning time where you're at, Leon. So, listen. I know you're global, and you've been busy. You've been at, the business is growing in spite of COVID. For our listeners out there who are interested in onboarding, they hear this and they go, "Man, I, I, I got to know more." Walk us through the onboarding process. If somebody just right now. You know, we'll put a link in the in the show notes goes you know I, I want to get get in touch with these guys walk us through what happens yeah so I think that if the if, if there are people out there that are listening to this conversation and they they kind of see the same stuff on the horizon as we do you know they see that there's pressure on them being able to operationally service their uh, their buildings in the face of labor shortages if they see that there are opportunities for them to uh, get better results out of their operational performance and that they're open to going on that journey to centralizing their um, operations. And that's, uh, that's probably that, that they're the types of people that should reach out. If there's people that uh, connect with this idea of a to-don't list, because that's the, that's the key. The to-don't list is the key to getting more productivity out of the same amount of people. You know, just giving, giving people a bigger to-do list means you need, need, need actually more people to deliver what you, what, what's kind of within your, within your scope. Um, 
uh, if people wanted to um, uh, engage with us, the first thing that we would need to do is we have this process of engagement where we understand what their business needs are, we understand what represents values, value to them, we understand what, um, uh, what, what kind of pain points they have. So it's as much of like the, the technology, technological solution as well as understanding um, what their business problems are. There's only kind of like a finite um, set of these different business problems and we've come across, you know, probably a lot of them before. Um, so it's about uh, understanding that kind of base case, understanding where they want to get to, and then showing them how they can get there by our technology. Now, onboarding um, during a pandemic is fine because actually the majority of connections to buildings that we do uh, requires zero hardware. It's just a software to software integration. So, you know, for example, with um, Woolworths, we onboarded all 1,000 of their grocery stores um, in 18 months without sending a single person to single one of those stores. Nice. So, so it so, just overlays on anybody's automation. So it doesn't matter what you're using, you guys can hook into it. Is that pretty much it? Or is, are there requirements? Uh, I mean, one of, one of the, one of the uh, I think one of the unique, um, uh, one of the differentiators about Bueno is that we aren't, um, uh, you know, we're agnostic, not just to the type of automation system, you know, whoever the vendor is, but also, you know, we're talking about evolving the industry from a, preventative model from the calendars to a data-driven centralized model. That's not just a problem for BMS and HVAC. It's also a problem for vertical transportation. It's a problem for fire systems. It's a problem for water treatment. It's a problem for refrigeration. So um, we see uh, our mission here is connecting to all these different systems and helping people take this centralized data-driven approach across all their engineering systems. So doesn't matter whether it, what type of BMS it is, doesn't matter what kind of refrigeration system it is. If there are, if there are people out there that are connecting with the ID, like if they see the same things on the horizon that we do, if they see that they're having pressure on um, uh, you know, supporting their operations through, you know, the, the, through being able to find the talent that they need out there in the labor market, um, if, if they see that the future um, of the property industry, if they connect with our vision and they see that the future of the property industry has these centralized specialized teams managing portfolios at scale, then they're the right people to, to talk to us. Um, you know, and the, and the key, the key to making this centralized, the, the, the two themes that we talked about, they're connected because if you want to centralize, that's about getting uh, the most that you can out of a specialized uh, team. Um, and the way that you do that is by giving them the biggest to don't list that you possibly can. And it's by looking at what the pain points are for the organization uh, and turn every single item on that list use technology to turn every single item on that list into a to don't list uh, it sounds great well it sounds like a you know a couple of things kind of somebody from my perspective so if i'm an owner out there and i'm listening to it i'm going look first of all i got to save energy but you know energy you know today i think it's kind of the icing on the cake you got to do it and your energy costs might be different than ours are and ours are getting higher and higher but so saving energy is one thing that gets taken care of. The operational expenses is where there's a huge, huge pop there. So you can make people more efficient. You can be able to hire less people. Maybe, maybe you want to hire more people, but you're probably going to have trouble finding them. So you're going to create a, a system where people can do more with less. And you're going to eliminate the, the need for more people because you're going to reduce the to-do list to a to-don't list. And, and all... Uh, and then you get, when you do Mad Max 4, you know, people, you'll invite them to the premiere, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And it's, this, is, this is even more important, I think, for people that have a growth strategy. People that are trying to grow their portfolios or grow their uh, services team or grow their facilities team over time. Um, because, you know, as they, as they start growing, they'll, and, you know, with this labor shortage, they'll start competing for resources, which will mean that their costs won't go up linearly, their costs will go up more and more, the more that they scale. And you, you actually want to um, deliver uh, performance, like you deliver efficiency as you scale. And that's, that's where we come in, is the technology to divorce the, um, uh, that relationship between your operational costs and, and the scale of your business. Well, and I want to add to the proven uh, technology because you've been doing this for a while. And, and, and I think if you want to see the future, uh, you know, just listen to what Leon's saying. And Leon, I hope we can get you to come back on maybe three or four weeks and maybe do a presentation for us. I think our audience would really like that. I, I love that. Um, and I miss you guys. So it'd be great to catch up again. Oh, it'd be great All to right. catch up for sure. Final thing, Leon, how do people get a hold of you? Best website? 
Um, our, our, our website is uh, www.buenosystems.com.au. So bueno, B-U-E-N-O, uh, systems. Awesome, man. Thanks so much, Leon. We'll catch up with you in about a month, okay? Sounds great. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye. All right, man, Kenny, I tell you what, man, Leon is so cool. He looks like that guy. Remember the singer back in the day, uh, the really handsome guy with the slick back hair, Robert, uh, and he oh, always had the girls dancing with the guitars. And Doctor, the doctor, give me the news. I got a bad case of loving you. That, uh, yeah, I remember him, sure. Yeah, I see No, it. no, he didn't sing that. He sang, might as well face it, you're addicted. Oh, to that's love. right. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. with the guitars. Uh, you were thinking about Leon Russell, I think, or something no. like that. I, I yeah. think it's also it's what it's not the same one, but he he sang that one too. Uh, God, see, see, we're, we're, I better we're, Google it. I better Google we are it. We, Kenny and I are so old that we remember when MTV was actually a music channel that had music videos, and now I think it's just all reality TV shows. Kenny, I don't see any music. I think if you want to watch a music video, you have to go to YouTube. Well, here, you know what? I, uh, let me see if I can pull this off without breaking anything. But uh, to your point, here's Robert Palmer. There he is. He oh. looks just like Leon. Yeah, does he? He's, uh, God, he, Lee, he, did do, he did addicted to love. So yeah, half, might, half as well, a point. might as well face it. You're addicted to love. So, uh, but good stuff. And we've, we've seen Leon before, man. We've really, really great presentation. I think anybody spent set in on one of his presentations, uh, just really realizes just how cool his software is and, and how well, well it works. Well, he was precocious way back when we, we first met him. Uh, I remember 2017, uh, he had the uh, whole group of people listening to him and the presentation he did. And uh, and that's where we first uh, met him. And in 2018, we saw him again and we had him on Control Tread, uh, episode 270, as a matter of fact. But uh, yeah, I mean, and he, he, he said, always said he's older than he looks because he's got, he worked as an energy consultant energy optimization consultant for, you know, getting his uh, wings uh, before he started Buena, but. Uh, yeah. How, 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 how does that sound though, where he's looking at the BMS system and taking a smartphone and taking a picture so he can go back and put it in a spreadsheet. You know? Oh, I can so. imagine. Uh, Cause you know, the, 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 look, look where we've come, look at the, uh, so now it's 2021. And uh, I mean, his portfolio is immense with all the, the big, you know, fortune 500 names on it. And uh, so he, obviously he's successful and they're, they're anxious to get back on the horse here in North America because of the restrictions that, uh, but imagine they shut the whole country down where, you know, we had some strict stuff too, but nothing that strict. Where well, you know, that's, that's, that's the thing is it, it's uh, and I, my trainer uh, is from Australia and he talks about that too. And just how different parts of the world, they don't mess around. Well, Larry Weber, remember from Honeywell when he was in China, somebody told me that they checked in on him and he said, yeah, we were, it took us a while to get COVID under uh, control in China. But he said, yeah, they curfew you. you and if you just come out, they just shoot you, you know? So uh <laughs> I mean, they just don't. Mess, the rest of the world just sort of doesn't mess around. So, uh, yeah, I think it it relates back to to Leon and and people like him with that software. <clears throat> you're gonna have to make sure your your tenants are safe, and you're gonna have to have a way to do it. And well, he, he said two things that just you know uh, the human side, the talent, you know, and the, the you know the um, the inverse uh, relationship between the aging population and and the and talent. Uh, the lack of ta talent, just it's not there and it's not happening fast enough. And we're making great strides. And everywhere I look now, I see signs of life, but it's like you're growing something in a field. It's going to take years. But um, I like how you said you take uh, the most output uh, for the, with a limited team and, and, and a smaller team. So making the technologies available to remove the, eliminate the pain points and make this team, the centralized expertise that you have in your, your organization can do more if you get, uh, get rid of the pain points and give them technology. And so, yeah. Well, you remember, you remember we were talking about that too. And I keep thinking this at some point it's going to rear, rear its head again. And maybe, maybe Leon's software sort of obsolete. But remember we met Dave Lorenzini, the guy that discovered the Google glasses. Oh, sure. And we interviewed that uh, company Lee company in Tennessee, where they would actually send their technicians out with the glasses. Right. And they'd have their most senior guys that couldn't get up on the roof anymore. And they would just sit there and they would just look through the glass and say, do this, do that. Absolutely. And, uh, and, yeah. yeah. And then the other thing that was cool about it was they realized that their biggest cost was they would lose more sales because the wife would typically be at home with the technician, the husband would be at work. And then she said, well, I'm going to have to talk to my husband about it. Right. And then what they were able to do was they were able to take a video with the glasses, what the problem was, the technician <laughs> would explain it. 
and they would email it to the husband, they would close the sale right there. So I keep thinking somehow that's going to be incorporated back in. What do you think? It, it, it has been. Yeah. I mean, uh, I remember the first few times I saw people that were actually emailing the bill as they were leaving the job site after a service call, they weren't allowed to leave the parking lot until they mailed the, you know, completed the, the sales uh, information there and got the customer's uh, acknowledgement. And then they right. sent the bill right from there. But um, yeah, we saw the um, different industries like the medical industry now is incredibly reliant on that. Uh, you know, the, the wearable technology so that the person doing the operation is getting, uh, you know, he's getting support from different parts of the world at the same time, simultaneously on, on operations and, and they're learning and they're sharing that information. And we saw in the oil industry, uh, how that's part of that's standard procedure. Now you go out there with your uh, wearable technology, yeah. it might not be Google glasses anymore, but uh, cause there's been some competition there, but absolutely. I, and I know last time I went out, and have a problem, we, we went into FaceTime. You know, we went into- yeah. uh, Well, that's right, with the FaceTime and the phone, that makes a lot of sense because everybody's got the phone, right? Right, And uh, but we were able to solve it there because the person just needed to see what the screen kept saying. Like you were laughing a couple seconds ago about you know, him taking a screenshot and going back to the office and then typing up his report based on the building right. automation uh, snapshots. But uh, yeah, so, I mean, bravo, let's get it. You know, uh, and that's why we have to be, uh, you know, and like he said, there was a couple of things he said. He said that, uh, you know, he had to, you know, break down the proprietary protocols. You had to, uh, you know, open uh, the data ontologies. And then more importantly, was that the costs are coming down. So the business case has become more and more attractive because it's not ungodly expensive. Like you well, you know, I'm, I'm thinking too, just based on this trend of the lack of talented people coming into the industry, that it, this isn't an option anymore. This is- right. It's not, you know, what you're going to do, it's kind of how you're going to do it. And uh, it's fascinating. And I think we've got to call the title of this episode, why a to don't list makes more sense than a to do list. I, I love that. Okay. Concept. All right. so, so we'll well, that. We, it was really interesting too, is uh, I was on the project Haystack uh, and uh, congratulations to project Haystack. Yeah. Yeah. I want to successful. talk about, yeah, well, let's talk about that. Yeah. Well, congratulations. The, um, okay. Yeah. But the, the, the Keystone uh, speaker, set the um the probably the, the bar there at the opening of the project haystack very intelligent gentleman uh, discussing uh you know what they were doing and where bim uh the digital twins but eric he said something that i i, I want to try to say as accurately as possible but it was like there's 35 percent more optimization still there with all the technology with all the incredible games we've had uh, you know, the whole idea of, um, he said that it used to be the owner wants to build a building, he hires an architect engineer. So the owner basically hands off the responsibilities and the knowledge to them. And then they hire a general contractor who subcontracts all the other portions out. So the architects and engineer uh, give it to the contractor and then, you know, it goes to the subcontracts or whatever. So that the, the basically what you get is an intent, you know, the, everybody's working towards the building uh, owner's intentions, you know, but somewhere they hit something that doesn't work. You have a little procession going on, go to the right and then back forward. But the reality was that they're trying to stop that, that the owner uh, never leaves uh, the, the, the centrally centralized management and understanding of the project. But to think that there's that much optimizing, that there's still that much, you know, I don't say waste, but there's just a lack of optimization in, in 2021. It's hard to believe that, you know, with all the technology. So it just shows you how there's going to be more and more uh, improvements and progress coming. Yeah. There's still uh, room, great. tremendous room for improvement. Well, great. And again, you know, uh, congratulations to Mark Peacock, John Petsy, and the rest of the team at Haystack Connect. So that was going on this week. So was Control Con with Scott Cochran. Congratulations to Scott. I think Jim yeah. Young and uh, our good friend Ken Sinclair were up there. So I know that was a big success. And then Fred Gordy had his thing this week, the cybersecurity, right? Right, right. Yeah, we're gonna have a couple of posts uh, out of that uh, that uh, Fred's given us uh, permission to post. Uh, that basically do a great job of just explaining how pervasive cybersecurity threats are and how you don't know what you got till it's gone. Yeah. You know? Right. Well, and I can pretty much tell you anything I said on this show that was offensive to anyone, it wasn't me. I was cyber hacked. And with that big dog, let's go, let's call this a wrap. I got to get busy for Mother's Day here, but uh, right. a special thanks to our guest, Leon Werfel from Bueno. Uh, man, good stuff from Leon, man. Be sure to check him out. And Kenny, remember, be bold, stay in control, stay relevant. And remember, get it to don't list, not a to-do list this week. Indeed, Eric. Indeed. Kenny Smyers. Kenny Smyers. That's a to don't. Bye, everybody. Have a great week. <laughs>